I'd like to invite Steve and Louise Sutton and Shane Mayer to join us up here from Fitzroy North. Um, I guess in some ways Fitzroy North might be um, Brighton a few years along as well. Um, and let's see, um, see what we can explore about that. They're a little bit slow getting up here. I'm, I'm taking the kids' chair. <laughs> little chair for Shane. I was wondering how that might roll out. So if I can introduce Steve, Louise and Shane. Steve, I'm glad to see you've got your coffee, your drink cup, because you don't go anywhere without that, only water. <laughs> Steve, um, I'm guessing that you knew your whole life that you would be in ministry at Fitzroy North. Uh, no, I didn't uh, grow up in a Christian family, actually, um, and so uh, uh, no, I had no no aspirations as a young young lad growing up to uh, pursue anything church-related whatsoever. So, how did you end up in Fitzroy North then? Um, uh, my family and I moved down from from Sydney. Uh, we'd uh, been pastoring a church there. I'd spent 23 years uh, in pastoral ministry. Uh, pastored uh, a few churches and been involved in, in missions work and uh, quite a comp- complicated story but we ended up in, in Melbourne and um, I thought I'd pick up a position within a, a church setting fairly quickly given my, my background. Uh, Lou had bought into a, an accounting firm which we thought would be financially uh, viable and she came to me after the first week and said, you've got to go and get a job uh, tomorrow. So I... Um, I uh, went out, uh, applied for a job in local government in the community development sector and uh, at the same time was uh, studying at um, a table uh, doing a master's. Uh, and for the first time in 20 odd years found myself um, as a congregation member rather than a pastor so it was quite a fascinating experience uh, being on the other side of the pulpit. Um, so there was this convergence of uh, events that took place um, in uh, in, in this move to Melbourne, that was quite disorientating, um, but uh, quite wonderful at the same time. Actually, not uh, my experience of, of being a church attender rather than a minister was uh, quite quite challenging. And my famous line is, I would turn to Louise uh, during church services when I was attending church. Um, I would say to her, "Please tell tell me we didn't do this to people." Um, I found church to be such a disempowering um, um, and uh, had very little relevance to my life now as somebody who was engaged in full-time employment outside of the church. Mm. So you're still not back in the church, seeing that story then? You're working in community development? Yep, Yep. and uh, and, uh, absolutely loving it, Uh, Mm -hmm. having a really great pay for a start um, and... um, and being appreci- to be in a work environment where you're appreciated as well is absolutely fantastic. Um, and in fact, I had stopped going to church. My uh, one of my kids would regularly say to me, "Dad, you've you've backslidden," and I said, "No, I'm just kind of reconstructing my my faith." Uh, but I, I was loving life, um, you know, going out for uh, for brunch and then wandering around the markets on a Sunday afternoon was a really great experience. Um, then some wonderful people invited us over for dinner. Uh, this couple over here, Rob and Rhonda, who we'd known back from our ministry uh, days in, um, up in Newcastle. And uh, Rob and Rhonda were the, the ministers at Fitzroy North at the time. Uh, Rob had had some serious uh, health issues and so his energy levels were low and uh, was kind of suggesting that it might be uh, a project that I might like to take on. Um, which I was completely disinterested, with no interest whatsoever. As far as I was concerned, um, I'd found my call in terms of local government, which was incredibly... Um, I, I found what was taking place in that local government setting. I, I'd lived such a church-centric um, life that I believe that the sole um, administrator of the Missio Day, of the mission of God, was the church. And what was... What took me took my breath away was the fact that I was involved in an agency that was making a significant difference in the world. In fact, far more of a difference than the local church was, to be quite honest. Um, so to leave that, to leave uh, you know, a great job um, and 
you know, just a, a sense of core within that within that setting. Uh, there was no interest whatsoever. Um, uh, but God has His way, and there was quite a. I'm from a charismatic background, uh, and uh, as we were leaving Rob and Rhonda's uh, after after dinner with them. I offered to pray for them because I felt so sorry for them. I really did. I thought, <laughs> oh my God, this is what life used to be like. I, I thought, I, I, my so heart. It was a pious prayer. It was. It? My heart went out to them. And the moment I closed my eyes, I felt, physically felt a, a baton, a relay baton being placed in my hands. And I went, God, I hate you. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you're saying. So I didn't say anything for about two weeks. I wrestled and wrestled with what I sensed God was uh, calling me into. Didn't say anything to Louise. Um, and when I did, she said, um, that's between you and God. <laughs> because if I say, uh, let's do it, and it doesn't work out, I'll get the blame. <laughs> Which says a lot about our relationship, doesn't it? <laughs> Just like the no responsibility clause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, Rob and Rhonda, we invited Rob and Rhonda over for, uh, for lunch. And during the conversation, I heard the story all over again. And Lou's looking at me thinking, well, am I going to say anything? And uh, Rob walks over and he says, Steve, this is the key for the front door. This is the key for my office. He says, I know God has called you. And uh, so we had a discussion as a family. Our kids were getting older and we said, look, this is an opportunity that is before us. How about we have one last family adventure together uh, before you kind of all kind of go. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Your final adventure in life. Final <laughs> adventure in life. Um, and so as a family, we, we moved to Fitzroy North. Yeah. Wow. I think it's... Um uh, just powerful to hear about the way that God works in us uh, and that we get there eventually too, don't we? Yeah. So um, when, maybe this could be a question for Louise, when you arrived in Fitzroy North, um, what did you expect and what was it like when you got there? Um, as, this was sort of, yep. as this was, you know, church number down the track, you know, totally knew what to expect was... Um, a lot of hard work and, you know, giving a lot of time and energy and sacrificing. That, that, that was the easy bit. The hard bit was um, understanding that the community that we were part of was significantly different to any other community we'd been involved in. Uh, we had been in Newcastle. We'd been in um, Sydney. Um, we, had, uh, we were out in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne, but uh, kind of Fitzroy North, inner city, very, very different community. And that was probably the... We lived for the first six months. We commuted from Berwick in to the, the church and talk about adventure. We eventually said to the kids, you know, we're going to relocate. The one thing we realised was you cannot do missional community unless you actually live in the community. So uh, we operate up, you know, m- you know, left the house, moved into the back of the church. Robin and Rhonda would know what that is like. We moved into a one-bedroom unit with three kids, two dogs and us. Um, and we lived out the back of the church, but you know that was that was the start of change. Was actually living in the community. But the the most difficult thing was recognising that uh, we were suddenly part of a community that had a, that was very much um, postmodern, and that was the most difficult challenge for me personally. Was having to actually adjust my thinking and my theology and my mannerisms and the way I communicated. Everything suddenly was being challenged because of this postmodern community we were part of. Yeah. Yep, yep. And I'm thinking of Brian describing what it's okay to look like in Brighton as well. Yeah. So what did um, Fitzroy North look like to you as you went around the community and what did the church look like? In your two weeks you tied in um, North Face puffer jacket. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it was the North, North Face jacket. You had to change your uniform to <laughs> Um The community is, is, is green uh, politically, uh, leftist, uh, incredibly eclectic um, cafe culture, a love for food and um, and things that are that are that are kind of a little bit out, out of uh, out of the box. Um, the church when we arrived there was uh, not like that whatsoever. It was relatively, um, I would say, relatively conservative. The majority of people 
Um, I think there was only three people that actually lived in the local area. The rest of the congregation commuted into the area from the outer suburbs. So there was a sense of disconnect between uh, the locality and the congregation. Um, and what was challenging is I, I'd been in other uh, kind of similar situations before and I'd always gone with a set of uh, a script of we know how to do this, whereas um, there'd been a whole bunch of deconstruction that had gone on theologically through my studies at Tabor. I'd been introduced to Brueggemann and um, Stanley Grenz, which was a bit of a change from reading Brian Houston and um, uh, Joyce Meyer. You know, I kind of went, as a whole theological world had opened up to me. And, um, and uh, yeah, just in terms of seeing God active in, in the world through uh, local government was a whole surprise. So I, I didn't have any answers. Um, lots of questions, but no answers. But there was a... A defining moment in those early days came. We'd been there for three months, and it, uh, in the three months of us arriving, three churches in the local area closed down. So I thought, God, this is a hard gig. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. This is going to be a really, really difficult challenge. And I was having a prayer walk one particular uh, morning around the area, and I was just saying to God, God, have you deserted um, this generation? Um, is there is there any hope? Uh, and that was the kind of question as, as I was uh, doing doing my prayer walk. And it was just leading up to the 2010 um, federal election. And every second house had a Greens poster uh, plastered to the window or to the to the to the fence. Uh, and where there wasn't a Greens poster, there was a, a the odd Labor Party uh, poster. And I looked at one of uh, the Greens posters and at the bottom of the poster it had the four values of the Greens which are environment, uh, democracy, social justice and peace and it was one of those aha moments. I just knew that I knew that God was already present and active in the, in the community through the... So, so for me those four values resonate so strongly with uh, the you know, biblical values of creation care, um, Democracy, giving people a voice, or the body being the body body ministry, social justice, of course, and then peace, shalom. You know. So it was a simple thing then, just to explain that to the people in the church, and then the church grew, and that was oh, great. Uh, yeah, it was just just like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> the, the church didn't grow for months and months and months. Uh, nobody walked through the doors. Um, it, it was really, really challenging. We had what the probably the. Most disheartening uh, day was a, was a long weekend. There was nine of us gathered around a table, and of those nine, five were me and my family. And we were sitting around uh, a table and having coffee, and the person who was leading the music was singing in a key which uh, was way off, way off the scale. It was, it was just, just dreadful. And in walked, and in walked this absolutely cool, funky guy who lived in the area and our kids got really excited and it turns out they knew him. He was a, a musician, uh, an absolutely brilliant guitar player and he happened to walk in on kind of the, the worst day possible. I know you're all thinking that was me. But it was. <laughs> <laughs> Another it cool guy. You're cool, funky, but you're not a guitar player. I play ukulele. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that guy, uh, Josh, um, kind of liked it because he'd been into a larger, involved in larger church settings that had the lights and the smoke bombs and all that sort of stuff and he was over that and just liked the idea of the simplicity of, of what we were trying to do and he came back and that was kind of the, I don't know, uh, maybe as we can mark it's it, Josh, a shrine. Yeah, yeah. Josh, Josh was that defining moment where something happened and it's, it's my conviction that uh, Rob and Rhonda and the team of people that had gathered around them, though they were relatively small, were in, had prayed for revival. They're much better pray. I'm, I'm not a great kind of intercessory kind of person. Those guys are, and the people that were in the community when we arrived were absolutely passionate about prayer. And I think what we did was we um, we were fortunate enough to have that that foundation of prayer that uh, was, I think, the catalyst for the growth then that took place from that point of, of Josh. And maybe we can mark it, Josh, and sell, set yeah. it out as... Uh, the Josh moment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Shane, since you're not Josh, how did your story intersect with Fitzroy North? Weirdly, weirdly enough, I met Josh. Um, I, I'm a Kiwi. I've moved from New Zealand. Um, hey, thank you. Um, and, yeah, so I was working in coffee full-time. I'd worked in church back home um, for years and years and years and felt um, my journey led me to a place of just profound detachment um, and, and, and reconstruction. I had started working with a bunch of young people who um, were, were pretty rough and had spent years, uh, yeah, just working out the best way of loving that community and in my kind of faith transition I realised that the, the gospel that I grew up with had very little to say to them um, and was involved in a, in a great community back home but was kind of um, in a very different place of emphasis to me so as I slowly um, disengaged from that and came out I, I really, I, I'd worked in the church full time since I was 18 as well and had this profound sense of disconnection from what was going on in the rest of the world um, and so, yeah, I moved over here and got into coffee full-time and was really happy doing that. Had a bunch of stuff to kind of process, so I wasn't really looking for a church. But um, as with a lot of people in our community, the common story is, <laughs> I want to call it like disclaimer church, because whenever you meet someone, they're like, I'm not really a church person, but I'm here again. And um, and I, I really felt that. I, um, I Through a friend of a friend of a friend, I didn't know anyone in Melbourne met... Um, Met Josh and um and had a beer with him and stuff and thought he was alright. But he um but yeah, so I started coming along to a um a congregation that was um happening on a Thursday night and it was just a really small group of people, it was just the group of people I needed at the time. Um it was yeah, um kind of discussion oriented and a, a real place of vulnerability and uh, I don't know how it happened. I somehow got tricked into looking after that after a few months. Um, and then as that community kind of um, journeyed together, it hit a point where um, some people were were moving and we decided to kind of like, rather than flog a dead horse, wrap it up. And I ended up, um, had spent a, bit, a fair bit of time with Steve at that point. And I think we had, you know, it was a real place of peace for me. And, and we'd had a, a whole bunch of, really great discussions. I don't know if I knew quite how much I was tripping him out at the time. I was <laughs> we're talking about things like redemptive movement hermeneutics and different things like this and Steve's nodding away and you know, I thought, oh great, he, you know, he's heard about this and understands this and um, so we kept on talking and only later on kind of found out that Steve had gone home after all those conversations and had small faith crises and um, yeah, but it was a, it was a, a great place of openness. Um, I I really was not I I wasn't interested either in um in working for a church again. But um yeah, had found a real place of peace. Had found a community that I felt like I belonged in and had something to contribute to. And where the power dynamics were such that I could kind of handle it. Um, I yeah I'm very um resistant to the guruism culture within within churches. I really struggle with the, the power dynamics. I think as, as pastors we've created a rod for our own backs by um, being the answers to everything and that we've profoundly disempowered the people in our congregations and pro- profoundly placed a weight upon ourselves that I don't think that any man, woman or child can, can handle. And um, and this was a place where, there, where I could be a congregant as much as a staff member and hold some balance in that. So. So how do you stop that dynamic from happening? Whoever wants to answer that. I think foundationally, uh, as part of my my studies, I'd um, come across uh, communitarian theology, a construct of uh, Trinitarian theology of God being a relational community. Um, And so rather than viewing the Godhead as Father, Son, Spirit, uh, a hierarchical uh, structure, I envisaged the Godhead as a family uh, sitting around a kitchen table and that the message of the gospel was, uh, which was where egalitarianism uh, uh, you know, sits for me, is the message of the gospel is an invitation to come home and sit at the table. Um, and so if, if God at the core of God's being is, um, is family and it's egalitarian, there's equality, um, with diversity of, of, of function and gifts, then I, the, the core thing that I went to Fitzroy North with was we need to reflect that in the way that we 
led church and the way that we conducted ministry. So I think sitting at the base of that was that that theology, that Trinitarian view of theology. The other main thing that we learnt from being in the congregation that we felt so disempowered and we felt we had no voice and that was another thing when we came in we didn't know how but we wanted to build a community where we felt people had a voice that they had a right to that every one of us had something of God to share that you know it's not all just in one person and I think that's another uh, facet of our community that we continue to really um, push that giving people a voice and giving room for every person to be able to say something or share something or ask a question or or raise a doubt or challenge in any way that that again was another part of that which I think helps to take away that guru thing yeah I think we learned through that to do that you had to teach people how to share space um, we one of our kind of transforming um, seasons in church, I think, was when we did a series on sexuality, um, and, and and it was it was a, a very long series on sexuality. Every article. series we do is a very long series. Three months, is that right? Yeah, that's a short series. No, it would have been longer than that, I think. Yeah, I, I mean that's I mean that's one of the things we are at the mercy of as well. If you want to discuss something, you have to take time. So basically, everything we do takes we say it'll take three months. It usually takes six. Um, yeah, so, but one of the things we had to do at the very start of that series, knowing some of the content that was coming and some of the discussions we had was to, was to, I guess, prepare and train a community of how to hold, um, a diversity of opinion, um, without kind of alienating, alienating and othering, um, the others, the others in the room, which I, I think as, um, you know, many Christians are kind of raised with a sense of um, the superiority of their truth, um, uh, which disagreements usually met with incredible hostility and vilification. And within our community, we already had to um, sort of create some common agreement around how we would dialogue together, how we would conflict, how we would share space with the other and not sort of try and colonise or shut other people out. And that move was a, was a, was really an accident. It, it happened because of some discussions we were having that profoundly shaped our community and that um, the maturity within our space, I think, for people to kind of be able to love each other and disagree and to kind of be able to speak out, um, you know, to, to be able to speak together and not have to feel that sense of homogenisation is really powerful. I think we try and reinforce that. We do things like um, like human scattergrams where... Um, you know, we'll essentially set up a framework. We did, we did one, we're doing a series on Colossians at the moment and it's our first kind of Bible study series and in our context, because of where our people will come from, because most people have kind of come through some kind of deconstruction of faith crisis or from outside the faith, um, there's a real anxiety around scripture within some of our community. Whereas, Others of our community are pre that, um, and, 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 and don't have that at all, and so they struggle to kind of understand each other. So one of the practices we did was kind of said, you know, as we even talk about reading the Bible together, um, you know, for some of you, you'll be really excited, for, um, because the Bible is a source of life. For some of you, you'll be just bored thinking about it because it's had no life for you for so, so long. For some of you, you'll be incredibly confused. Um, you, you look at scripture and you, don't, you just don't know what to do with it. And for others of you, you know scripture too well and you'll be incredibly anxious because of some of the stuff that's in there and the reaction that it provides within you. So we essentially got people to stand somewhere in the auditorium along the spectrum of where they stood and then look at each other and make a kind of commitment to understanding why other people share that space that they do. So trying to reinforce that kind of that diversity is okay but and unity isn't compromised by it. Yeah, cool. Now I don't know um, if anyone's got a question that's beginning to yearn on their heart to ask yet. If you do already, just put up your hand so that I know if there is already a question. If not, I'm going to ask another question and um, we'll just have an opportunity for a few minutes of questions if someone has some in particular. So while um, these guys are talking for answering this question, see if you have a question. If so, just pop your hand up so I know. Thanks. Um, I, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is how um, where you're coming from is expressed through the way um, you use your buildings and what worship looks like and what community looks like, what the week looks like. You have to share some thinking or some stuff around that? Yeah. Um, with our, with our uh, facility, we have really have endeavoured to set it up as a, a place that's open to uh, those in our neighbourhood. Um, so 
in order to create some level of financial sustainability for the place, uh, we rent the venue out. Um, so we have AA and dance groups and um, choirs and a whole bunch of uh, various users. Uh, we also, uh, because our family didn't have the, the financial resources to buy in the Fitzroy North area, so the house prices, you know, for us as a family would be one point to 1.5 starting point. Uh, we've, uh, there was enough room for us to put a manse in, in the building, which so we really are very incarnational. Uh, we live on site. Um, and then we've also, one of the great needs in the local area is around uh, a co-shared workspace. A lot of people work from home or work from cafes, so we've uh, put in a uh, co-shared workspace where people just, you know, rent. You might desk. not be able to tell from his accent, but he's saying co share there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like he's saying kosher. Kosher. All right. <laughs> it's. Uh... Um, and yeah, in terms of the way that our auditorium is set up for church on Sundays, again, it comes back to this relational, communitarian uh, view of the Trinity. We meet around tables and chairs, which facilitates discussion. We realise for people who are introverted that's incredibly difficult and we have people walk in and go, this is not for me, um, and others really... In- we have yeah. hiding spots around the back for them, though. Like, yeah. There's lots of, there's plenty yeah. of introvert space if you want it. On behalf of the introverts, I say thank you. Yeah, and under the tables is open also. <laughs> um, we, we debated for months and months and months about a stage um, because of this thing of trying to create a flat... Uh, you know, this egalitarian thing was so uh, significant for us so we finally relented and went one step up. Um, that was purely pra- for practicalities in terms of people at the back being able to see uh, somebody if they were on stage. But w- all of those kinds of things have informed um, our facility. Maybe let's talk about Sundays, how... Um. Well, with Sundays, there's a liturgy team um, that the guys meet. And part of what we try to do on Sunday is um, actually make it a creative space. We're in a very creative, artistic area. Um, and so we do try and make room for that, for the creativity, for uh, doing... Um, and a, a Joel is part of our community, um, and the liturgy uh, that Joel did this morning, we had that um, around Easter, I think it was. Joel did some of that. So, you know, that kind of thing, we are really open to that, to try and do, um, we've had, you know, breakout spaces around the building and we'll share communion in five different ways. We'll share it in silence or we'll share it in an Anglican, um, you know, communion service or we'll, we'll share it over in the park for those that create, you know, connect through creation. So, you know, it's not something we do every week, but we certainly um, try within our um, community to leave room for um, that creativity, recognising people connect to God all in, in all different ways. Um, so, yeah, that's part of what we do with our Sundays. Yeah, I think one of the mo- most difficult challenges in our context is to, in, in a world that's kind of bent around the service model and around um, consumption, to try and work out ways of breaking that down and convince people that when you gather, it's a gathering of community and not a service that's provided is a profound challenge that I'm sure we'd have more to learn off you than you would, would from us. Um, but we're really trying to tackle that and work out what that means, um, to, to, to give people space where they need it. A lot of people were kind of, you know, on the very, very far margins of, of, of faith um, and to give them space where they need it, but to try and work out a way of not letting people confuse a, a gathering of a community with, uh, with, with a, a service that's provided for them. Um, and I feel like the better a job you do of Sundays, the worse job you do at creating community. Um, and to try and close that gap um, to get energy from the bottom up rather than from the top down is, is, a, is a massive challenge because we're all trained from the day um, we look at advertisements to see the world as a series of products to be p- purchased and consumed and to try and break that and get a congregation who are essentially turning up to something as they would to a concert or any other thing to try and create ruptures and fractures kind of in that in that thinking and um, and, and gather around the invisible visible person of Jesus Christ is a is a huge challenge. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Is there a question that has emerged for anyone? Yep, there's a question from Andrew Menzies. It looks like, and Paul Cameron is running very fast towards you. Great work. 
Thanks. Um, no, my question is, uh, this morning from Dave, uh, we heard about him approaching a new community in Castlemaine and now from you, Steve, and Louise and, um, and Shane, in terms of Fitzroy. So my question is, uh, in both examples, you've had to actively do really contextual theology and local theology and walk the streets and see greens, triangles, and etc. Um, and Dave with Castlemaine. For a lot of us, we are really used to our contexts where we do ministry and yet perhaps what we do in that community is not engaging with our own suburbs. What are ways that, um, in your reflection, uh, that we can do a little bit better contextually in listening to our community so as to be salt and light? Um, Great question. I spend time drink lots of coffee in local cafes, but I think um, one of the key things is that we engage in conversation with our community, and so it's responding to the kinds of questions that they're asking, and I don't think churches, well at least certainly I hadn't in the past, um, we didn't train our, our community to ask the right kinds of questions, and I, so I think that would probably be the most powerful thing, is maybe you can, you're yeah, I mean, maybe a different angle on the question we kind of talk, talk about a lot within our liturgy team and governance at governance level is is what the role of the church is. And I think the church has a um, tendency to only really invest in something that they can put their badge on and say that this is what we as an organisation are doing. Um, whereas I think one of our approaches is to do as much, to do as little as possible, so that our community, so that our people can be engaged in the community at large. Um, and, and really, if we can teach them or if we can learn together about what the kingdom of God looks like and then go out and out every day and, at day and do that and then use, I guess, the kind of gathered, organised community as a nutritious space for feeding each other and then go on our separate ways and do the work of the kingdom of the world, I think... Um, we our ego dies a little in that process because we don't have our name on all these projects and things that we are doing. Um, but God's work's been done, I think, in an infinitely more powerful way. I just think of so many Christian organisations I've seen, um, sorry, church projects I've seen that have done a really, really crappy job of something that someone else is already doing in a much more powerful and much more effective way. And sometimes you just go, why, why can't we just release our people to live their lives and connect with um, what else is going on out there? Um, why is it that our church has to have our name on, on everything? Yeah. So I think simplification is part of it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if there is one more hand, we'll go for it. Is that a Rowan Waters hand there? Yep. I think it's a salvation yeah. response. <laughs> Again. <laughs> the buses will wait. Coming from the Blue Ribbon Liberal seat of Mount Martha, in Mount Martha, I'm wondering how green governance works. Green governance? <laughs> well, just the governance yeah, of your church in terms of... Uh, yeah. Um, well, we do have, we do have a, a leadership team um, and then we also have a liturgy team that works on our Sunday, curation of our Sunday services. But probably the, the, the most significant thing that we've... Uh, invested in as a community around governance is actually what we call our co-creators. So they're people that um, have a, resonate with who we are as a community. So we don't have a church vision statement or anything like that. What we do is we, we have, we've listened to the stories and the themes that have emerged over the, la- the past few years and we document those, those stories and those themes. And so people who come into our community who resonate with those stories and feel like they can help shape the future um, and are willing to take responsibility um, for, for, for us as a community as well as just breaking that service model um, uh, construct. Um, we invest heavily in, the, in, in co-creators, so we meet regularly. We just had a church camp last weekend of co-creators so we close down our services twice a year just to go away with our co-creators. So we meet with them to hear what it is that they think, um, even to the point where we're even considering at the moment in terms of what do they want in terms of pastoral ministry. Um, 
we think we know what the church needs, but if then if if they don't want or feel like they need me or want to pay me, well, um, they need to have a voice and express that. And, and so it kind of is quite dangerous and was it wild around the edges? Um, yeah, so that's quite, yeah, that's quite significant. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we're a church in transition as well. When I think the church needed a lot more directional leadership at the very start when it was just beginning to form. Um, but as it's kind of, and, you know, so I'd call that kind of organisation from the top down and energy from the top down where essentially you say this is what we're doing and, you know, who, who can you find to get excited about it. As the church has come into a place of, I think, much more stability and health, our model, you know, around that kind of Trinitarian state um, it is to try and now shift to see the power and try and, um, yeah, really work in with our community to try and empower and energise them. Um, and, and, and in that sense, kind of covenant together around what it is that we feel like God's called us to do in our, in our place and time. So we're in a transition to try and work energy from the bottom up and, and leadership from the bottom up as well. And that doesn't mean that we don't think there's a place for leadership because I think there's a, you know, I mean, I see myself as a congregate, a, a congregant who's kind of been set aside for, I mean, I'm, um, very much around the Peterson model of pastors as people who sit as kind of a conduit of stories between culture and tradition and scripture and th- their community. Um, and, and so I think, you know, there, there's definitely a need for that. But um, unless, there's, un, un, unless there's kind of a fluidity, unless we can work out ways of empowering our congregation, um, I feel like it's just, yeah, it, it rests too heavily on a couple of people.